sorry. I uh, I don't expect to do things like that. No, we're, it sounded beautiful to me. You keep going. So here we go. Welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show, live here in Ojai, California, joined by a guy who is um, just an amazing musician and his decorated career and a uh, phenomenal human being, Roger Kellaway. Welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. My pleasure to be here. Um, I wanted you to talk to the audience about Interdeterminacy, uh, those al that album that had an impact on you. Uh, it was essentially Cage and somebody else playing in two separate rooms. Can you break down 
why that had such an impact on you? Well, indeterminacy was the name of the album. Indeterminacy. Yeah. And, and the concept was <laughs> that whatever Cage was doing in his room and whatever David Tudor was doing in his room, they couldn't hear each other. So you and I that were listening to the result of what the two of them were doing in time and space, we're the ones that got the results. What I've not actually heard that album. I mean, how did it not sound like, for lack of a better word, mush? Well, it, 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 you're dealing with uh, two extremely creative people. Uh, both of them have a sense of space. Maybe that's the answer. I never thought about that. Of course, it could have turned out um, complete chaos. I'm, I, I'm just trying to grab, like, how was it, so they were recording at the same time in separate rooms. Mm -hmm. There was no, like, post-production. No. The, the, the Stockhausens, the, the composers of the 20th century, uh, when you first heard that music, how long did it take you to get your head around it and, and try to put your own individual stamp on it? I didn't do anything with Cage's music until uh, I did a film uh, called The Mafu Cage. And the, it, that was a horror picture. And the basis of the horror picture was Africa. Just to make a long story short, it had a cage and everything. It was based on a French play called Clouds, and everything in that actually entered the cage died. Hmm. And, I mean, it, it, it was with Carol Kane and uh, Lee Grant. And uh, so because it was African, I decided to use two prepared pianos. And I had not used prepared pianos uh before, and of course, the prepared piano was invented by Cage, because he was supposed to do a ballet for someone I can't remember who at the moment, and there was uh, there was no room in the pit for any kind of orchestra, mm. so he devised the percussion orchestra out of placing different fabrics or dowels or screws or all kinds of things inside the piano. Actually, you f I first heard that in a piece called Sonatas and Interludes for Prepared Piano. It's a wonderful piece. Who's the original composer on that? He is. Cage is. Cage, and on the LP, you can see uh, a total photograph of what the inside of the piano looks like. I, d I don't remember if, I, if that... LP ever made it to, uh, to it's a pressing. CD. It's been it's been pressed on, on vinyl, but never never maybe on CD. Well, it it has it's been recorded several times. Whether that photo exists or not within the other productions, I don't remember. We we had a great hang on the radio, uh, and you talked about the ragtime players being the most unpretentious players. Uh, you got to meet UB Blake along the way. Um, Yubi Blake's right there behind you, on the wall. There's Yubi right there. Um, when you got to New York, who gave you your big break? Somehow I got into the studios. Playing jingles? That came later. I don't remember who who first hired me as a, as a pianist for the studios. Um, People want to see you talk, make sure you can... Dave Bailey was the one that, uh, that got me into the Clark Terry Bob Brookmeyer Quintet. Right. How did, so how did you know Bailey? I don't... Uh, well, okay. Dave Bailey was part of my first album that I did in New York. 
I don't know how he came to be the drummer. Uh, the reason that uh, Ben Tucker was the bass player was because I was working Jilly's um, opposite at that time Bernie Nero. And I was playing bass with the other piano player. Upright. Upright. You were playing upright bass. Yes, I played upright bass for 10 years. And when <laughs> Bernie left Jilly's to become Peter Nero, he recommended that I take his place on piano. So I took his place on piano and I took his bass player, who was Ben Tucker. And that's how we got together. And maybe Ben recommended uh, Dave Bailey. Mm -hmm. The I, the one prestige album that I'm familiar with is with Russell George on bass. Is that your second album? Hmm, maybe. It, I don't. I don't. It, it's fine. Now you know. Yeah. You know. I, I. The keep the keep the comments coming in, and, and the, the audience is loving this. I just can you talk about in your mind mm, how we moved. I just hate labels, but music, improvisational music, went from the unpretentious, the ragtimers the Dixielanders, the, the Beboppers, to a place now where it's kind of meant for upper crust society. Uh, you pay... It's mental. Explain. It's extremely mental. Well, the Dixieland people, I, they're just a bunch of people that want to get together and jam. There, I mean, there, there is no pretense about it. Somebody counts off a tempo after we've decided what the tune is, and, and we just play it. it. It it gets more cerebral as you get into bebop, and then as you progress towards uh, the 50s, and one of my favorite bands was Miles Sextet in 1958 with Coltrane and... Cannonball, and the Red Garland Trio. Philly Joe, oh, yeah. Paul Chambers. Yeah. What yes. about what about that rhythm section? I mean, the recordings, first of all, were not being run through a Pro Tools rig. So there was no. a lot of space in the recording. But what were you hearing from that rhythm section? Was it tension and release? I, I, this is absolutely critical. It, I, uh, absolute perfection. Perfection. I, I, don't get, I, I, I'm not, I don't get off on perfection. <laughs> okay, perfection in terms of concept of how to play together and how to swing together and how to accompany. And this, this, this one record, Milestones, I think was the first example of Paul Chambers doing a Bode solo. And he does it on Mr. Jekyll which is really fast. I don't think any of us had heard a Bode solo before. Mr. Jekyll, he plays the bow. Yeah, it's a Charlie McLean song. The, the, uh, the idea that, um, uh, when, did you, when did you actually pick up an upright bass? I mean, I, like Don Preston, the great keyboardist, uh, mm -hmm. he played bass with Elvin and like Ollie Jackson, Melt's brother would take a break in the third set late at the West End Cafe in Detroit, and they'd let Don play bass. And so, were you? Were you? I didn't know he played bass. Right. <laughs> Nobody does. You know. And 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 the thing is, uh, did you play gigs uh, on yeah, upright, or did you get I to did. sit in? Who you? Who were you playing with? It was junior high school. Oh, okay. So it was going back to to, to oh, the yeah. early the early days. Well, there were eight eight piano players and uh, Vinny Morato, who was the the head of the uh, of the orchestra, or the band actually, um, pointed to the bass player and said, "How would you like to play one of those?" I said, "Sure." And I I was already studying piano, so I could read bass clef. So I stood next to this guy, his name was Tenny Peck, and I looked at the notes in the bass clef and I watched to where he put his hands. So I taught myself how to, how to play the instrument that way. 
Four years later, I became fourth bass with the Massachusetts All-State Symphony under Frederick Fennell. And I did a lot of, a lot of Dixieland things, particularly in Copley Square in, in uh, Boston. I know it well. BU graduate I am. You were playing Dixieland? There, the Hotel Buckminster in the basement with uh, Dick Boitmore and Kaz Brodsky, uh, F Fluji Williams, which may be a name you know. What was the instrumentation? Because the tuba, I was always under the impression the tuba was, was supplying the bass lines in Dixie. Well, not... Not in this band. Not then. No. Not, and so it was banjo... No, that's, old, that's older. That's older. Banjo's older, too. In, in really traditional Dixieland bands, you've got the tuba and the banjo. But not, for instance, in the in the Eddie Condon bands. Mm. You got Eddie on guitar. Uh, there's always an upright. Usually, Arvel Shaw plays upright bass. No banjo. Same with the Rampart Street Paraders, which is the West Coast version of the Eddie Condon band, if you will. I played with most of those guys, Nick Fatul. And and uh, Eddie Miller, Matty Matlock, George Van Epps on guitar, who, whom I think invented the seven-string guitar. Could you? So, oh, let yeah. me tell you though, there was one instance when I arrived in New York in 1960. I sat in with Jimmy Jufri and Jim Hall. And Jufri was essentially asking me to join the band because he was looking for composers that played. You joined the band as an upright player. But I didn't join the band. It was a very complicated time in my uh, first marriage, and I just got to New York, and, and I decided not to do it. So now I look back historically, the next band that Jufri had was Paul Blay and Steve Swallow. I just talked to Steve. I did an interview with him, and we played. It was a road to Damascus for Jufri because he, he he was playing free, very free. And you would have been in that amalgamation. Yeah, yeah. I've <clears throat> always wondered. <laughs> can, can you play a Dixieland tune for us? Um... I can't play a traditional. Yeah, I mean something more in the in the vein of the uh, the, the Copley Square gig, which would be like. Uh... Mm -hmm.
there's more left hand in, in, in the concept. When I worked uh, at Eddie Condon's, and uh, there was no bass except on weekends. So you had to have a left hand. You were supplying the bass? Yeah. It was uh, like kind of a Nat King Cole kind of trio set up? There? Well, I'm just saying no bass. It was uh, guitar, drums, piano. Yeah. And then the front line, a regular Dixieland front line. A trumpet, trombone, clarinet. <clears throat> and bass on weekends. But And that's when I was playing piano and, and doing Dixieland gigs. Of course, when I... In my earlier years, when I played with Dixieland bands and I played bass, that was a regular piano, bass, drums. Um, the Will to Swing. This was a book Gene Lees wrote. A, uh, uh, it was about Oscar. Mm -hmm. I mean, was was the did, is swing? Swing was a parent. Swing is a parent. Is it something that? can be taught or is it something that internally you always, I mean, the, when you say the word will, I mean, you have to have a will to swing. I want you to break that down and, and how you got to that point of being able to swing in any musical context. Well, first of all, let's go to the book. Gene asked me, how do you feel about Oscar? And I said, the will to swing. Yeah. So that's where the title came from. And I always thought that about Oscar, the will to swing at any time. And, um, now, as to whether that can be taught, I'd, I don't really have an answer to that, but uh, if I did have an answer to it, uh, it might disappoint a lot of people. Because I don't think it can be taught. It's just one of those things. Explain. Ex well, okay, yeah. here's, here's the thing. When you're playing, let's go back to uh, uh, the Red Garland Trio. Why are they so good? Aside from the fact that uh, I, Red Garland is one of, well, they're all my f favorite players. I, I never met Red. I never met uh, Philly Joe. I did play with Paul Chambers. You did get a pl chance to play with I Paul. I played one night with Paul Chambers and Wes Montgomery and Jimmy Smith, the half note in New York. Oh, man. Wait, wait, an organ piano? Jimmy you, Jimmy was playing... No, no, no. The drummer. drummer. The drummer. Got it. Right, so you played with Wes, Chambers, oh, yeah. Jimmy Smith, the drummer, and yourself. Yeah. So you, Okay, so you go back to that rhythm section. We were making uh, the bumping... West Montgomery Bumpin' album. That's at the right. Time. You're on, that's absolutely right. You're on that. The okay. Yeah. So we're talking about the uh, communication between the musicians. Chemistry, and when that works, and it doesn't always work, but most of the time it does, then. Uh, we're we're talking about going into swing because swing is basically the the concept that that trio played. Maybe it's more modern than than what a traditionalist would call swing. You know, if you want to talk about Tommy Dorsey or Glenn Miller, or uh, I don't think of Miller particularly in that way, but uh, Dorsey. Yeah, Billy May was was the guy for me. Basie, Woody Herman. Now you're reducing that to just piano, bass, drums, but still, wonderful concept of rhythm. Everybody's playing together. Who could not play on top of that? So they could only get Miles and uh, Cannonball and. At Coltrane. <laughs> Coltrane at, at a time when uh, I, I particularly uh, enjoy his playing. It was uh, early, early. It was Coltrane. not the modal period. Yes. 
one of the revelations on this journey is, I mean, I've, I've been doing, uh, I mean, I think I'm approaching 3,000 interviews. Uh, uh, I ran into a cat named Denny Sywell, and uh, he was no friend. a dear friend. Now, I want you to break down this band, The Pleasure Principle. <laughs> Kellaway was headed to the West Coast, so let's... Because DeMonico, uh, Chuck, Chuck DeMonico, deep spirit, and has been a spirit on my journey. He's long gone. He taught you how to drive a four or five ton truck as well. So I want to know about the pleasure principle and and this whole and then ultimately going to the Fillmore West to play. Yeah, I, I guess we've talked a lot about. Well, I've talked to a lot of people, and then they tell me stories. Denny's like, "Oh yeah, Roger was in the band." I said, "Roger Kellaway was in the pleasure principle." Yeah. So that blew my mind. Yeah, it was me and Joe Beck, uh, Tom Scott, uh, Denny Sywell, Chuck DeMonaco. Well, Joe and I had been playing around with the idea in New York. And basically, we could all play the concept of the music. Which was which what? Which was basically rock and roll. Mm -hmm. But uh, we didn't really have singers. You know, I sang, Joe sang. We put a few few tunes together. Chuck was a... Uh, used to drive a truck in uh, Chicago, so he was the truck person. I just got to learn a lot about how to drive a truck and how to maintain momentum going up hills and and the courtesy of, of truck driving. I was going to say, um, did you meet Denny in the studio? How did you meet Denny originally? Russ Savakis got him into the studios in New York, but I'm still trying to figure out how you guys connect. Gee. Maybe through Joe. Yeah, I think that that's possible. But you were that was psychedelic rock, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, I, I, with jazz inflections, right? I mean, are, are, there are no tapes of that circulating around. No. There's only, um, uh, if it exists, and it probably does exist, but I don't know where it is uh, in my shed, there's a tape of How Do We Get There From Here, mm. which was uh, a commercial that, that we did, that Joe and I sang on. And that's the only reference. I remember we used to, we used to play, uh, we had a rehearsal room out here. It was a small room. And at that time we were using Ampex speakers and the bass speaker was like turned up to number 10. I mean, my, my pants were Waffling, yeah. Just from the dBs and the and the energy coming out of the uh, the amp, and you had to actually focus your hearing somehow into the center of the room in order to hear the whole band. Denny was using sticks that were almost an inch thick, so that he could hear himself. <laughs> so the, the the output. That's what I wanted to. You know, I'm thank, I'm glad you brought that up because I. Whether it's Kenny Barron, the more I do these Facebook Live interviews, the dynamics, the dynamic range you guys show is phenomenal, and I tend to attribute that to the fact that you were playing out of PA systems for a long time. I mean, these were not state of the art uh, sound systems. Right. Do you? How did you develop your dynamics range? Is it, did it have to do with the fact that you had to stretch your ears out because not everything was mic'd at all when you first started? You know, I've never really given uh, the electronic aspect of my career that much focus, because each time you get you go to a gig, you're you're faced generally with a piano you've never played, and you spend most of your energy working it out with uh, uh, finessing the piano and and uh, you know will it do what I want to do. Will it go abstract, it, or maybe it won't do that? Maybe it'll just do ballads, or uh, you know, whatever. The, I mean, Joe Joe Sample said it was it was whatever dog du jour was in the club that night. You didn't know? Did you have to bang pianos back into tune just to play them sometimes? Well, I uh, <laughs> I, 
I never tuned a piano. But like you said, you, you were at the mercy of whatever That's correct. ivory you had. Yeah. Was there a time that you can talk about when it was just horrendous, but you got through the gig and made it work? Maybe there were keys broken or... No, I played a... I, uh, I played a gig... Uh, I can't remember the... Uh, Rosengarten. Bobby, Bobby, Rose Rose Bobby Rosengarten. Bobby Rosengarten. I played a gig for Bobby Rosengarten. It was like a summer party in humid weather. <laughs> and they had, it was outside by the pool, and they had brought the piano the day before. Moist. And they had tuned it the day before. However, with the humidity, and all that. By the time seven o'clock rolled around at night, uh, only about half the keys on the piano worked. So, if someone like yourself, how do you through. you made it through? <laughs> you have to find what works. I, yeah. Um, and also the yeah. bugs it, crawling up and down uh, yeah, in the cracks and. Uh, what were your intentions for getting into music originally? I just knew when I was 12 years old that that's where I was going. You had a calling? Yeah. I think now, and I have for many years looking back on it, that it, it, part of it is a reincarnation thing, and I've been doing it for several hundred years. Can you talk about, the, I, I noticed that book, the... Eastern spirituality in a Western world. Can you talk about this reincarnation? It, well, I believe in it. And, um, when, when I look at, uh, how much it is I know about music and uh, at the level of, of what I know, I still feel like I, there's so much more that, that I have to learn, but in relationship to someone that comes up to you and says, boy, I'd I just love to play the way you do. And let's say they're uh, uh, a younger person, maybe 30s, maybe 20s, but, and I'm talking to them from my 70s. It's going to take a long a long time. The journey is a long one. So I, I had to come to the conclusion that it must be longer than just this lifetime. I do not believe the concept of uh, uh, you're born, you live, you die. I think that's silly. Because there's some, they just, it, 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 there's a sense that there's a connection here. It's a long melody that you're that you're doing, and it's uh, I, and I've done it before. It's the forever journey. Yeah. But did you have you had, um, you know, sort of dreams or situations where you've you've seen yourself or some other reincarnation of you in a diff in a different life playing? But, no. No, I haven't had any dreams like that. In reincarnation, do you believe that you come back in a different life form? Like you could come back as a cow or a horse or do you... I'm a Taoist, so I, to me it's all about transcending the cycle of birth and death. And reincarnation is a very, very strong... I, I'm you know, a big believer in that. And it's really about accessing your true nature against your habitual nature. But I just wonder about... Do you come back in a different form? In your well, I, I I think there's some choice involved, and and there uh, it has to do with um, whatever your soul lessons are. Now, I have I done uh, you know like a hundred several hundred years consecutively <laughs> as, as a human right. being. Right. I don't know. So it could be inter intermittent. It could. I've read a lot of books about uh, the uh, life in between. 
It's pretty fascinating. Well, I'd love to get hip to some of that stuff, too. Uh, but people are clamoring. Uh, could you play, like, uh, just anything off? Just just play an improv piece? Sure. Roger Calloway yes. here on the Jake Feinberg Show. The great, the great uh, Dennis Budimer, uh, he was telling me in our radio interview, um, one time you were, uh, you were doing arranging and composing for Barbara Streisand, and uh, everybody, the cats were all there burning, and uh, you had your arrangements written out, and everybody was, was cooking and finished the take, and everyone thought it was great. And Barbara came out of the studio and said, I don't like it. And he's and and Budimer said that you had to take everything that you had worked on and rehash it again. I mean, did, did you do you recall that story? Oh yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> how do you how do you manage your ego at a time like that? Obviously, it's Barbara Streisand, right? But you everybody all the musicians. Let me, yeah, let go, me tell you what was happening go at ahead. that time. I had just finished Est, so that was virtually I I, I could deal with anything. And, and uh, I even had a conversation with Barbara and John Peters about Est, and they basically said, well, yeah, but uh, we're, con we're shrink people. What, is that, what, do they, what does that mean? They're, they're, they're psychiatrists, and um, they, they go to shrinks, and uh, that's, that's the way that they uh, uh, attempt to uh, get to know themselves better and work through whatever is the they have to work as opposed through. to your at the apparatus yeah Dennis is talking about the very first cue that I did for a star is born and I, now here's an aside I'm working on Invictus for Clint Eastwood and he wants me to conduct and uh, orchestrate and I go to the Clint Eastwood scoring stage at Warner Brothers, that is the studio where we did A Star is Born. Mm. It's, it's exactly the same. So, anyway, I write this piece, the first cue, and uh, I don't remember if it was Barbara in the booth or she came out to into the room, but she said, why'd you write that? So, we talked about it. Um, yeah, I stayed up all night that night and rewrote half of it. 
and I came back in the next morning and uh, and she liked what I did but this is a this is a process with her anyway I wrote a closer for her for Vegas it was a gospel arrangement years and years and years ago because at that time she spent five thousand dollars trying to change whatever she wanted to change in the chart only to arrive back at the original chart so it's just kind of a process that she's going through now here's another aside four days ago the phone rings I pick up the phone I say hello and on the end the other end I hear hello Roger this is Barbara Streisand <laughs> Okay, immediately, Just check it in. immediately, I have several feelings about this. I mean, one is, you got to be kidding. Well, I'm, I'm I just want to be nice. No, I want to be clear, though, for the audience. You, that wasn't, you've collaborated with her since that, that time. No. No. No, I haven't. Not since 77. And you're telling me she called you last week or a couple days ago? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the reason she called me is she's writing a book. And she wanted to ask me uh, some things about the scoring of A Star is Born. And it actually, uh, yeah, yeah. It, we had a, it was very cool. Did you tell her what really happened? Did you tell her the truth? Yeah, sure. I mean, I answered her questions. Uh, she was very cordial. And um, what was odd to me was in these situations with stars that are that big, it's usually a secretary that calls and says, have you got a couple of minutes? I've got Miss Streisand on the phone. Not you know, direct okay. from, yeah. All right, so I call Alan Bergman, mm -hmm. whom I, you know, I, I've done a lot of songs with the Bergmans. And, uh, and Alan said, yeah, she called you, didn't she? I said, yeah. What? He said, well, she called me first, and she said, how do I get a hold of Roger? I've got a couple of questions. And, so he gave her my cell number and she just called. And it, it was wild to go back to that time and uh, I had a 60 piece orchestra. Now, in, with, with regarding union laws yeah. in terms of uh, fees and salaries and things like that, if you change your mind, you change an instrument, if you uh, go from uh, flute to saxophone, let's say, you've now increased the uh, salary for the player 50%. And she would change her mind, but I could also change my mind, which was kind of interesting, because it was Streisand, there was no budget. It was open-ended. Wild. Wild. <laughs> Unheard of today. Now, there is one cue in the film, and I can't, it's, it's probably, it's got to be a rock and roll piece. I don't know if it's something Gene and I wrote. I have to research the, the, uh, hey, we'll the, the score we'll update, because yeah. uh, Gene Lees and I wrote, I think, a couple of incidental tunes for, for that. But anyway, we had Phil Ramon as the engineer, and we had a, a sizable string section that we had uh, 10 rhythm that we were laying the basic track with. And then we had the string section. So what I did on the piece was I took the progression of the whole rock and roll piece and I wrote it backwards for the strings. <laughs> <laughs> just why? Because I could. Right. And I just, I. Uh, it, it kind of it came out like sort of Phil Spector. And Phil Ramon said, "You're crazy." I said, "I think he was laughing about it, but uh, because <laughs> is basically the kind of sound that you got. You have to give this string something to do." Um, I mean, this is. That that just blew my mind. I mean, so you, she, I just want, you had not, after that though, um, she did quite a few albums, but didn't, it was a 60 piece band. I think that's why Budimer was so bummed about her response. Cause everybody, you know, it was just so much work. And then it was like, 
Why do you play that? I'm not saying she doesn't have a right to her opinion, but. Um, well, in that situation, again, I just finished the S training. I just flowed with it. I had lots of members of the orchestra that were completely annoyed. That, that and you were just, fact, you were just, you were, you were buoyant and bouncing just, away and no, nope. yeah, no, I, 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 said this is the way it's going to be. I, How did you meet Maharishi? Maharishi. I was with Bobby Darren. My wife and I went to England. And we got to England, and the gig with Bobby Darren had been canceled. But we heard that Maharishi was in Wales, in Bangor, Wales. So we went to Bangor, Wales for a week. And that's, good. well... That's kind of how I met him. I mean, they, they, so we were listening to his lectures there. The, the sad part about it was it was on the very day that Brian Epstein had died. Mm. The Beatles were there, but nowhere to be seen. They were just dealing with, uh, with Epstein. And we came back at the end of the, uh, the stay in Bangor, Wales, and... Uh, I, I'm pushing the, the uh, button for the elevator, and the elevator comes down, and the doors open, and there's Maharishi. I, I, it was unbelievable. And we were we were big transcendental meditators at the time. And you had, you were already into TM before you met Maharishi. Yeah, Paul Horn was my initiator. Sixty seven. That is so late good. sixty-seven, eight. Uh, um, that that was Darren. It's actually, it's in the middle of Bobby. So when did when that you, Paul initiated you in like who was your teacher? Uh, like were you going to lectures in the states? Because I always thought that Maharishi came here. Um, and then cats like Densmore and, you know, Paul Farso and, uh, so many, uh, you know, uh, they, 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 they got off on listening to his lectures at Berkeley and places like that, but you were mm -hmm. doing this, these, the TM started for you. Um, who was your, who were, besides Horn, who were the, who were the, the sort of gurus? Well, you know, I, I, I think Maharishi was still, uh, doing it all because, I remember two years in a row we went to the 17-mile drive up by uh, San Francisco. And I'm, I don't, I'm not really remembering clearly, but it seems to me that Maharishi was the one doing the lectures. <laughs> also, we were, I was involved with Jordy Harmel. Yeah, that's right. I did an act for him, and Jordy was the sort of the black sheep of the Hormel family. And he had a studio near Paramount, but that's that's not the studio that that the story's about. The studio is the Village mm. Studio in Santa Monica. Jordy bought that building, and on the second floor was the TM floor. And we went to lectures, and it was Maharishi. Can you talk about, I mean, when I walk into your house today, <clears throat> and just my feeling, I, I mean, the way you talk, I mean, you have a totally Zen quality to you. D did Maharishi, what was, can you, just for people that in 50 years, um, I mean, we bring in great scientists from India now. We bring in great doctors from China. But we don't bring the Gurujis anymore. And I just wanted you to talk about Maharishi and his effect on your contemplation and your psyche. Well, first of all, TM, because it doesn't involve any kind of concentration or contemplation, it's a very easy process to do. Um, <clears throat> Maharishi's concept of talking in a lecture 
is that he keeps going round and round and round and round on the same information. He just tells you a different way each time. And in one of these times around, you're going to get it. So I always thought that was, that was really brilliant. He'd have different ways or different ways of explaining the same thing over yeah. and over again so that you'd walk out and say, I know what I learned. It wasn't just a mass of enlightenment or information. Yeah. It's if you know you've learned something. And you're, you're not hung up on, I mean, you don't say to yourself, you know what, he was talking about that an hour ago. It doesn't come out. But that, see, that's the magic. Yeah. You're right, right. When someone said, you know, I heard that before. But no, it was, it's always fresh. Yeah. Um, I just had a chance last night, total chance. I, I, I drove in, um, I flew into LAX and called my dear friend Emil Richards. And he said, yeah, we're celebrating Joe Porcaro's 88th birthday at Bogies tonight. Why don't you come down? And I really wanted you to talk about my favorite, the, what really got me hooked on Callaway <clears throat> was Come to the Meadow and Ed Lusgarden, Chuck DeMonico, mm -hmm. Emil Richards, Roger Callaway. Conceptually, I mean, the pictures on the back indicate you guys were just wonking out in there, writing and having a ball. There were... Uh, stragglers walking out of the woods uh, during that time. Uh, it was, yeah. s but explain the concept. That's a drummerless album. There's no trap set on it. But I just want you to talk about how you guys work together to put those seminal albums together. That's really when you came on my radar, and it still touches my heart to this day more than ever before. Well, I, I, I'm so glad. I, I, I'm. I, just project it's a little very, bit. Very meaningful. Those years with that particular group. I wanted to do piano and cello music, but I wanted it to be original. I didn't want to do the repertoire. What, what, just for the layperson, what is the repertoire? Is it more classical based? Or, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sonatas and. Uh, you know. And you were looking to do a more. I don't. No, uh, what, what were you looking for? Well, I didn't, I didn't know yet. I started working with Edgar. I started writing some songs for, for just Edgar and I. And then uh, somehow I came to, uh, well, I, I did everything with Chuck on bass. And I, I don't know how I decided on the marimba, but the marimba was the right sound because then it was, the group was all wood, which I... Really like the sound of. Oh, I did. And yeah. Emil being a, a percussionist, um, we knew that we could do odd times because uh, Chuck and I, and well, Chuck and I kind of grew up through the Don Ellis band. Edgar had had so much studio experience that he could play any concept. <laughs> so, whatever you write for him. The only difficult part about the group w with Edgar is he didn't want the solos to go on for very long because he had nothing to do. He was not an improvisation no. person. Interesting. No, I, I spent the better part of my life writing out things for certain people. I, I know I you had have. had a very good... Yeah, you've done okay. Yeah, I've done, yeah. But I had a teacher, Henry Lasker, in high school that said, don't ever write out jazz for classical people. And I've spent my whole life doing it. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you play uh, Come to the Meadow? Uh, or something off that, something to give the audience an idea of, of the... Something about... Um, I haven't done this in a while. Uh, <laughs>
for someone who hasn't played that tune in a while, it sounded beautiful, man. Well, I mean, you got to take a, uh, take a minute to get into it. Because oh. Emil and I were doing... Or, uh... Uh, exactly. And, uh, and <laughs> there was no chart. I, I started doing... And Emil just went to six below automatically. And that's how the tune began to evolve. The changes on the tune and the concept of the tune are uh, much more akin with folk music in, in a way, even though the, the progression of the tune uh, is pretty sophistic sophisticated. But that's kind of... Yeah, that's what wound up, that's what wound up happening. Was, <coughs> was the... The second album. So we had already done the morning song. Uh, we'd done Georgiana number two. We had we had, had chamber orchestra. We did uh, Saturna, which uh, Herb Alpert let me do the thirty-eight piece orchestra. Did you spend a lot of time in electronic music uh, studios in New York or Cologne, Germany, when you were really no. fat? So, but I, mean, I, I want you to talk about your fascination. But I did, yeah. I did spend a lot of time listening to Stockhausen and uh, Luning and Yusachevsky and uh, a lot of um, tape manipulation and things like that, which I experimented with myself. Can you talk about some of the manipulation, the, the rolling, the, do, going back, doing backward tape? All these. <laughs> I, I just want to me. Actually, you, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about that first tape recorder. You still have that first tape recorder. You know, I do. It's a web core. <laughs> and they don't make that technology anymore. But I want, I want, at that time, you were looking to sonically, you just wanted sonic expansion. You just wanted to keep playing and, and growing what you heard in your head. Yeah. I, I had, uh, I was working with Paul Beaver. And Paul and I put together some tape backgrounds for, I think it was a blues or maybe it was a tune called Double Fault. But um, the idea was indeterminacy. Now to go full circle in Absolutely, that conversation. Absolutely, man, right back <clears throat> in. And it, Dick Bach was the, uh, was the producer talking about Spirit Feel, and, right? Spirit Feel. Yeah. The album with John Garren, Tom yeah, Scott, yeah, and yeah, Beaver. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and DeMonico. DeMonico. Yeah. Again. But there's a, there's a track on there. It wasn't mixed the right way. You didn't have a chance to mix it. <clears throat> it wasn't mixed the way I I wanted it to be mixed. It's the track with um, there's one track with Red Mitchell. Anyway, the sounds, because I didn't have any control over the mixing, the sounds came in intermittently, but they came in as background sounds. They didn't come in to wipe out what I was doing, which was my intention, because that's kind of what happened in the original indeterminacy thing. That album, which I listened, Blues for Hari, I mean, there's so that that album burns but did beaver i was i was always curious whether he played live with you at that gig well he he ran the tape recorder <laughs> he ran <Yeah. laughs> i'm just thinking now about the indeterminacy thing yeah the indeterminacy album was cage telling one minute stories in one booth and david tudor with a whole bunch of electronics in the other booth. And Cage, he's telling 61 minute stories. So if the stories are short, he uses space. And if the stories are long, he speeds them up. But he never knows when Tudor's going to come in with anything. And the concept was that if David did come in with, with something and it kind of wiped out what, what Cage was saying at the moment, that was fine. That was what was intended. 
I it was, really it was really okay. Did you play with Elvis? You know, we just resolved this. Oh, you did? So, yes. You had to resolve something like that? I mean, that Well, I, I knew I, I'd spent a day with him. The question was, what did I spend a day doing? <laughs> Making, well. Uh, okay, here's what happened. <clears throat> a lady from the Netherlands sent me uh, a photo of an album that, Elvis did called Let's Be Friends, and somehow she had researched through some book and found out that I was the piano player on three of the tracks. So, do you have memory of that, or? Well, I, I haven't played it. Uh, we we got it, and my wife Georgiana did her own research, and she found out. That what I was doing, she thought I, I was doing Blue Hawaii, right? The soundtrack. I was doing the soundtrack for Change of Habit. Unbelievable. Which was his last film, his 31st film. And that's what we spent the day doing. We had about uh, eight, eight rhythm or something like that. And we were in Universal, 1969. It was all live. It's uh, really a, it was, it was a nice experience. He was uh, a gentleman, but well-mannered and uh, not the crazy person that uh, everybody thought he was. What year about was this? It was 69. 69. So, I mean, Don Ellis, uh, Neapolitan, Ray Neapolitan, who's tuning in, um, at one point in Don's band, you had three upright basses in that band? Mm -hmm. And two drummers. Can you talk about the propulsion of of the band at that? I mean, the burning nature of double drums, three upright basses, and just the fact uh, with a leader like Don, who was always way outside the box. I mean, I just talk about how much fun it was to play that stuff. Well, it was. I mean, Don, the, the, the charts were wonderful. It was a lot of power. Bonesville. Bone School was the first time um, I, I remember taking uh, mescaline, and I went to Bone School one day, and and I just sat down and I started doing something like this. <laughs> I just realized that I could completely go inside the sound and and uh, bring out one tone or bring out another tone. Or... Mescaline uh, allowed you to access a, a, a metaphysical part of your creativity? Yeah. Those were the drug years. Right. <laughs> a lot. I mean, there's still a lot of drugs out there in the music scene, you know? I mean, that that was always the thing about the... Um... Well, it isn't... Let me just say this. It isn't on my music scene or the people that I'm connected with. Uh, Georgiana and I went back to New York uh, for a second time at, at one point. And at the point that I left, if you were not into drugs, you were not part of the team I, in the studios. Okay, I've and heard. Now, I, I want this. Back, is, yeah, yeah. It was the opposite. When did you leave? So you left New York in what year? Well, I I know we were back there in '83, and we came back in '92. Right. Did you play at the original Birdland? Yes. Play with Kai Winding. Kai Winding at the original Bird. All I'm saying is there was a lot of cats in the 50s that if you weren't on junk, then you weren't in the club. That was the word. That was what you know through my research and interviews yeah. about Stan Getz. Was that? I mean, but I've also talked. That was to, not part of my right because I talked to Dick Hyman and David Amram and all the cats that played, and they they stayed straight. Yeah. 
before I let you go, um, I'd just like you to talk to the worldwide audience about your concept of love and how you bring love to the world. You must open up your heart. and surrender. Easier said than done, but surrender. Can you talk about a time in your life when you were fighting it and overcame it and eventually surrendered? I think, well, when I first met, uh, when I first met Georgiana. Your wife. Yeah, that was a, uh, that was the beginning of a transformation for me. That was almost 53 years ago. How did it transform you? It took me many years to realize that, that she loved me. Um, I mm. actually attribute this to being a male thing because you're so sure about what it is you think and you feel <laughs> that you've got to have a moment at some point where you go, oh my God, she actually loves me. I, I, and it's a, it's, a, it's a revelation. Is it ex accepting that love too? Mm-hmm, yep. Yeah, it's a struggle. You're right, it is a male thing in some ways. Uh, an ode to Larry Bunker. Larry Bunker? Something that Larry would love. And not, it doesn't have to be out of the songbook. It can just be anything. But you talked about Bunker. I mean, that burning session. I just saw uh, Berghofer last night. He's <laughs> playing better than he did 50 years ago. I mean, it, it's ageless stuff. That thing at Dante's is a killer. And so, okay, let me tell you a story about that. We're doing, I think it's the opener, and, and Zoot's doing, Okay, but the first part, That sounds like the melody. It's not the melody. It's the second part. Al Cohen had the melody. It was his chart. But you, you never knew that. I only got this maybe five years ago. It's like, wow, we, all, we, all, we always thought that was the melody. But you listen to it, and there are many times in that tune where you hear he's playing tenor two. But it just sounds right. So, anyway. Bunker's waiting. Bunker's waiting. Uh, Roger Calloway, yeah. total legend.
Roger Kellaway, thank you for inspiring people around the world. Much love to you, my man. It was great to have you on the program. Thank you. That was called All My Life, by the way. <laughs> this is the Jake Feinberg Show. We'll be back later.